This is Real Estate Rookie episode 263. The, the more offers you put out, the easier it is going to become for you to find a deal that makes sense. If I only submit you know, two or three offers a week, most likely most of those offers are going to be rejected. If I submit 200 offers a week, I'm probably going to get at least two or three deals that actually make sense. So yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic thing. My name is Ashley Kerr and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we give you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And today I want to shout out someone by the username of J. Biddle one. And this person says fun, educational, and motivational. Ashley and Tony bring fun and motivational dynamic to the world of real estate investing. I enjoy their personal stories, especially when they don't go as planned. They continuously show you how you need to work through issues that pop up and not give up. Keep up the great work. So Jay Biddle, we appreciate you. And if you haven't yet left us an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform it is you're listening to, Please do us a huge favor and do that. The more reviews we get, the more folks we can help. And I honestly love being able to start the episodes by reading some of these awesome five-star reviews. So Ashley Carroll, what's up? How are you doing today? Good. Pretty good. You know, it's just a gloomy, chilly day in Buffalo, New York. Um, but it's playoffs for the Bills. So <laughs> by the time this airs, uh, we will know what, have, what has happened. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's an exciting time in Buffalo. Um you know, we just had the everything that happened with Damar Hamlin and just the Bills Mafia is just amazing support. And, you know, I was talking to someone the other day about like how tragedy brings people together. And I, I think that brought the, the NFL together, all the different teams, but like Bills Mafia, they've already been so uni- united and like such like a great community that um, it didn't really need to bring everyone together because everybody was. So I think just having, you know, something like that happen really puts into to check how like short life can be, scary can be, and also reinforces your why as to why we're all doing this, why you guys are listening to this podcast right now, like what you want to happen. Um, in the time that you have left. So, uh, not to start out the podcast and like, you know, a, a, a downward spiral here, but I just thought it was important to mention and not to, you know, maybe you have a reason that you want to stay motivated. And I think that can kind of no, uh, kind of touch on that. I think it's a great thing to bring up Ashley and, and yeah, maybe it sounds a little morbid or whatnot, but it is the truth, mm-hmm. right? Is that we, we all never know what could happen tomorrow and, and mm-hmm. more likely than not, most of us will see tomorrow, but, um, you know, there, there's, they're called accidents for a reason and there's something that you can never plan for. And you have to ask yourself, are you waking up every day living a life that is fulfilling? Are you waking up living every day in pursuit of the life that you really want? Are you waking up every day um, happy? You know, and, and so many people don't. And, you know, the average person is overweight, unhappy, and underpaid. And I, I, I feel grateful because hopefully by listening to the Real Estate Rookie podcast, we're giving people the, the stories and the resources and the tools they need to start take, taking steps towards that life that they actually want. So I, th- I think it's a great way to start today's episode, actually. And just to touch on the, you know, the real life of that stuff is like, yeah, those as real estate investors, you can really like make the life that you want. But like, there's also those days like last night where I'm chugging an energy drink and up till 1am because I won't be able to sleep unless I finish something, (laughs) you know? So there's like those stressors that are still in your day, but it's almost like an, an adrenaline rush, I guess, in a sense. So not to say that me and Tony have like these perfect real estate or trash. Evelyn, Tony's in Texas right now, lives like there's definitely those days where it's chaotic, but I love that every day is different. And I feel like we're almost always in sync when we pull like these late all nighters. Cause I was also, I was literally up until two o'clock last night because I was at this conference all day, but I still had work to do after I got back from the mixer. So I didn't get back into my hotel room until like almost 11 o'clock and I still had work to do, you know? So there, there are definitely those, those long days. So if I'm, if I look a little tired turn, during today's episode, it's cause I only got like four hours of sleep last night. And before you even mentioned that people are already commenting, what's your skin care routine, Tony? You're just glowing. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so I was I was on stage at Rob's event and we were doing like a Q and A on stage and Rob was the one reading off all the questions and it was like you know how do I found, find my market how do I deal with this guest issue and Rob pulled out one question and it was what is your skincare routine and so that question is following me everywhere so I'm happy to officially announce actually on the podcast that I am now launching a one hundred thousand dollar mastermind on my skincare routine so if you want to join there's a there's a link coming soon you you do actually need to start a skincare routine. <laughs> yeah, I don't even have one. Or you need to do like my skincare routine, like do a t-shirt and then on in the back, it's like buy a short-term rental property, cash flow, like this makes <laughs> yeah. you glow. Like that's there you my go. Secret. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So in today's episode, we have brought our mentees back that you guys are getting to know. We have Brandon, Lawrence, and Melanie, and they're going to share the progress that they made, the questions that they have, and each also give some advice to you guys that you guys can learn from them as they're going along this journey. Yeah. And there's, you know, I think one common thing we saw from all three of them was a little bit of fear and hesitancy. So you'll get to hear how Ash and I kind of encouraged all three of them to to push through that and and uh, what they should be doing on the other side. So I'm excited because one of them made some really tremendous progress, actually. Um, and, and we have probably one of the biggest updates of this whole mentee experience. So I'm excited for you guys to kind of see who that is and, and what steps they've been taking. And make sure you guys reach out and congratulate them. So after you take a listen, because um, it's pretty awesome. Huge accomplishment. Melanie, welcome back to the show. We are so excited to have you again. Do you want to fill us in and what you've been doing the last couple of weeks? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. So good to see you guys. It's been a good week. I was able to submit an offer this last week, which was absolutely my most important next step. Um, and I think that was great momentum for me. I'm I'm still very excited about finding a property, but unfortunately this particular offer, uh, was not accepted. Um, happy to kind of break that down a little bit, um, and, and talk about the purchase price, depending on how far we want to go into it. But it started with, um, you know, a little bit of a low ball offer kind of as advised here to be more aggressive and not be so worried. Um, and then they countered and we did not accept the counter, but instead wrote back asking for seller financing. And then they proceeded with another offer. Melanie, what market did you end up making this offer in? This was in Savannah, Georgia, where I've been focusing most of my energy. Um, And this was in particular in unincorporated Chatham County, which is outside of the city, still very close to downtown, but just has um, much fewer restrictions on short-term rentals. And this was the first offer you put in in Savannah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want to go through and kind of talk about the deal a little bit. Sure. Um, so this particular property had been sitting about 50 days. It was listed at 250, which was, um, nice and low. It had just been recently updated and, um, had a great interior, just really, really nice upgrades, uh, for photos, at least, of course, I never saw the property. Um, and we ended up offering 200 and asking for 5k seller concessions. So it was pretty aggressive. My agent was, you know, a little bit, um, just kind of also saying that this was aggressive and I knew that going in, but when I had run the numbers, I was just being really, really cautious and conservative. Um, so I was going to put down 10%, about 20 K and with current interest rates, just going through traditional financing, I was looking at about 1600 a month for a mortgage and then factoring in property management because I'd be out of state and landscaping. I was looking at about 2100 a month in payments. And so then I started going through what occupancy, various percentages of occupancy for the month would look like at the average daily rate in that area. Um, And, you know, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now, but um, in looking at a lot of listings in the area, just kind of clicking through and looking at available listings, so many of them have, you know, less than five bookings, which has just kind of you know, worried me a lot. So I've been talking to a property manager locally and asking him what his average occupancy is. And he, he quotes about 60 to 70%. Um, even still I ran the projection at 50, 60 and 70%. And at 50%, I'd be looking about a hundred a month in uh, take home. 
60% occupancy is around 500 a month. And then at 70%, I'm looking at about a thousand, um, you know, take home at the end of the month, which is great. But that forces me to be, you know, closer to 70%, which I'm just not sure if that's realistic or viable going into 2023. Um, so when they countered at 235, I considered it um, 70% occupancy, you know, slightly less income. Um, is still kind of, you know, I think a stretch for what to expect in 2023 as a new Airbnb, but I don't know. I'm open to feedback there. Um, In short, I I ended up writing back to see if they could come down on the, um, or at least work with us for seller financing. So that interest rate would be lower and make all those numbers look nicer. Um, But again, they didn't move forward with seller financing. Did they say just flat out no to seller financing or it was just no to that offer? It was just no to seller financing. Um, And my agent said that he sees that pretty often a lot uh, or most agencies speaks with don't aren't as familiar with seller financing. And so from his experience, he sees that most of the time they just don't move forward with it um, at all, kind of like advising their clients against it because it's unfamiliar to them. And so we decided for all future offers, you know, unquestionably, if it's a seller financed offer, we're going to add a one pager to the offer, just speaking to the benefits of seller financing, which is something that um, I learned from someone at the the BP conference, um, which I wish I had tried on this particular offer instead of, uh, you know, hindsight 2020, of course. Yeah. So one one follow up question for me, Melanie. When you're when you're doing your analysis of potential occupancy, I know you said that you're using you're, you're looking at the Airbnb calendars, which is a, uh, obviously a, a great free resource. Have you utilized any of the paid tools to do some of that analysis? I had in the past looked at um, STR Insights, and I've used Data which is just which is a free tool. Um, I haven't done. I haven't paid for AirDNA, for example. And the reason being, I spoke to this property manager in the area um, and he kind of recommended that we talk about each individual property, uh, particularly because he said that Airbnb data can be really helpful, but it can also be really off the mark just based on kind of which neighborhood you wind up in. Um, He's been in the area for eight years and said that for the most part, he's pretty familiar with the streets that do really well. So in some sense, I've just been leaning on my team and and that as a resource instead of data. Yeah. So I, I like getting that local boots on the ground is, is obviously super, super impactful. You said this is a this is a PM that you've been speaking with a short term rental property manager. Yeah. Yeah. So I would I would also go out and get some data, though, to help you make uh, make a more informed decision. So uh, AirDNA, fantastic. Price Labs, another fantastic tool. But what I do when I'm comping properties, and I actually just did this for one of my students yesterday, is I go into, and you can go into either platform, but I, I typically go into, into Price Labs, and um, I will download, for example, what's what's the bedroom count on that property that you're looking at? Three bedrooms. So I would look at all of the three bedrooms in this city, in Savannah, Georgia. I would export all those listings. And I would, you know, take off the ones that have really bad reviews, right? Like if anything less than like a 4.6, I'm not going to look at those. I would take off the ones that aren't active uh, all 365 nights out of the year, right? If it's only active half the year, they're not really running it like a true Airbnb. Maybe it's just like a, a hobby for them. And I just kind of start paring that list down. And what happens is I go from 400 four, or three bedrooms in that market down to like 150. And then I literally click through all 150 of those listings, I open them up and I say, how does this listing compare to my listing? And if it's a good, if, if it's a good comp, I'll keep it. If it's a bad comp, I'll delete it. And that 150 ends up becoming 25 to 30 uh, comparable listings. And when you export that data from a paid site like Airbnb or, or Price Labs, you get to see things like, what was this listing's occupancy over the last 365 days? What was this listing's average price over the last 365 days? What was this listing's revenue over the last 365 days? And that's data that you can use to help you make a more informed decision around what do I think this property will do in 2023. Now, 2021 data, 
I would probably discount that a little bit because 2021 was such a banner year for for short-term rentals. 2022 data was a little bit more realistic in terms of what we can probably expect for 2023 moving forward. And if you want to discount it a little bit to, you know, the uncertainty, whatever it is, you can do that. But those are the steps that I would take, Melanie, to really drill down on your numbers and give yourself a little bit more confidence in the analysis. That's super helpful, Tony. Um, I appreciate that. I, I definitely can. I see the value in the data driven of data driven approach. I think two things that are giving me pause and I keep bringing this up. Um, and I think it's just the cautiousness in me is that I think it's hard to account for two variables that like aren't present potentially in the past, which is increased competition and then just the, the current state of the economy. And I know that you can't like you can't measure everything at some point you're taking the leap but those two things i i just you know i just am worried about and so maybe that's just me needing to be a little bit more risk averse and a little bit less cautious um because i know i do want to buy but i i want to have some sort of tool to to measure for those and to anticipate that let me let me ask you a couple of questions, Melanie. First, those are both super realistic concerns to have about investing right now, right? Is, is saturation or, or competition and where is the economy headed? But if you buy, say you close in this property today, do you plan to sell this property in, in six months or less? Do you plan to sell it in, in 12 months or less? Yeah, no. 18 months or less? How, how long do you plan to hold this property? I mean, as long as, as long as I can, you know, at least I would say five years, eight years plus. So let's say that the economy goes into a recession today, into a deep recession today. Do you have reason to believe that that recession will last for five years? No. And you had provided some great information about how long they typically last in general. Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes I can go to worst case scenario. So I do value just taking a step back and getting some perspective. You know, there's also a side of me that's just, I just want to have certainty about making, you know, that this is my first short term rental. I just want to be really sure that I'm taking a leap into a, a high performing one. And I think, you know, I will probably look back on that and laugh because the perfectionist in me wants this first one to just be like perfectly cash flowing. And I've heard so many stories about that, you know, you really do have to learn. And the first one is a learning opportunity. And sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not. So um, it, it's good perspective. Um, so thank you. I think that's a really good point right there that a lot of people get hung up on and even myself included is you want that first deal to be perfect because you want to maximize your profit. You want to maximize your cash flow because you are putting what you have into this property, your first property. It's your it's your baby. It's your leap. It's your jumpstart into real estate investing. And you just want to maximize it. And I see a, one way I see a lot of people get hung up is okay, I have $20,000. Should I put it into one property? Should I get a two mortgages and put, use it as down payment? Should I, you know, put it into somebody else's deal and be a private money lender? And they're just trying to maximize what's the best use of their capital or the resources that they have available. And so for you, it seems like it's just like getting the best purchase you can get, getting that best purchase price, and it's going to maximize that daily rate, and you're going to have this wonderful cash flow. But think about what are the worst case scenarios when the, when you run these. So when I like to run numbers, I'm looking at you know how, if it is a short-term rental currently, what do the numbers look like right now as is? Um, and then what is the best case scenario? Like, what do you think the numbers could be on the property? And then what is worst case scenario? So at worst case scenario, are you breaking even on the property where you're not having to put any of your own money into the property at all? Is it maybe you're putting in a hundred dollars a month into the property worst case scenario that it might not actually happen, but would you be able to afford that worst case scenario and you're still having, you know, that equity pay down, that mortgage pay down in the property and building up that equity so that one day when you do sell or, you know, maybe daily rates change again and we get into, you know, another high period of traveling and those daily rates go up or some event happens that then you're, you can increase that cash flow again. 
And then what are your exit strategies on the property? So I think trying to not focus so much on how do I get the best return? Because just getting into that first property, even if you break even, I mean, my first property, the cash flow was so minimal, so minimal. I mean, I forgot to include snow plowing. Okay. I live in Buffalo, New York, and I completely forgot to include the cost of that. And that didn't put me negative, but it still hurt my projections and wasn't as great as I thought it was going to be. And then it was just an older home. There was repairs. We went through an eviction after a couple of years of having it and just all these little things happened, but I learned so much. And like, once I bought that property, I bought the next property within three months because it just propelled me. And I think that's the most important thing. And if you talk to a lot of investors, I always think of Jay Scott. He bought this property with his wife and it was a disaster. They were going to flip it and they had to turn it into a long-term rental. When they actually sold it, I think he made like a thousand dollars maybe on the profit so many years later. And, but he's, I don't regret it. He's like, that got me started. I learned a lot of lessons, things like that. So just try and keep those things in mind. Yeah. Thanks, Ashley. Um, yeah, the, the maximizing profit is something I have definitely been focusing on. And, um, I have a a long-term rental in Denver. And I think, especially after just spending a lot of time listening to different investors and different I guess, podcasts, I think there was a, there was a lot of me that thought, you know, I really didn't maximize my profit. I definitely did my best on that property. And I really, uh, you know, I was very cautious about that one as well, but I wish I had done more to maximize what I put into that one. And so this one feels like, okay, I really, really want to be maximizing it, but I, I really hear you in the, when you say, you know, when you're thinking from the long term, both the learnings and the opportunity to come, um, that's probably the best place to focus because, uh, you know, the tourism industry is going to shift and bookings are going to increase and it does have an exit strategy for long term rental. And um, this area is growing, the population is growing. So I definitely think there is potential and, and maybe it's just more about trusting myself and it's just, it's just the, the risk factor, you know? And, and to clarify, it's not even your first property. Cause obviously this isn't your first property, but your first investment in a certain strategy, because the analysis is so different that if you went and you purchase another long-term rental, you may not have that over, you know, analysis on it because you have experience with the one, you know what to do this time. You're more confident because you already did purchase in that property. And there's that opportunity to maximize the profit a little more because of that experience. So yeah, I think taking into the short-term rental as to, you know, now you're looking at daily rates, you're looking at different ways to pull that data from than you would the the long-term rental. Yeah, absolutely. So Melanie, I, I, before I was, as we wrap things up here, I just want to clarify. So we, we talked a little bit, but based on our, our conversation right now, what do you feel are the, the most important next steps for, for you uh, as we move into our next conversation? Um, I definitely need to take a little bit more of a step back from the fear and worry and just trying to maximize that potential. As Ashley is saying, consider other factors, the future, the long-term viability, and then from you, Tony, also be uh, pulling in true data from Price Labs or AirDNA and and use that as more of my analysis instead of um, taking these super conservative approaches. That's, I mean, from this conversation, that's absolutely what I want to take out of it. Um, I think there's also, you know, I also have an interest in maybe seeking out some assumable mortgages in the background, just to kind of take some of the worry about the high interest rate out. Um, But that is my plan for next week. I I really want to continue making offers. I still like making those aggressive offers. So I'm hoping to stick with that momentum. Yeah. How many, how many offers do you think you can realistically submit uh, Melanie between today and the next time we chat? I think four is reasonable. How about 10? 10. Okay. <laughs> I like it. And and here's why, like, it doesn't matter what it's listed at. You submit the offer based on what your numbers tell you. And I, I think I shared this, this with you last time we chatted, but I had an offer out on a property at, at 312. Mm-hmm. Property was listed at four. They came back at 350. I said, no, they came back at 320. I think it was, they said, no, they came back at 315. I said, no. And we're under contract right now at 312. 
Wow. So you you have the ability to submit the offer at whatever makes sense to you. So 10, I think, is super reasonable because there's probably 10 properties that are listed. Those properties might not just be at the price point, but you submit those offers to the number that makes the most sense for you. Thanks, Tony. I am going to take that on. Hopefully, I'll be reporting about 10 offers next time. (laughs) There you go. I love it. Thanks so much for coming on with us today and sharing your journey in the past couple of weeks with everyone. Um, We really appreciate it. And let everyone know again where they can reach out to you too um, in case they, you know, didn't listen in the other episodes. Yeah. um, I, last time I said, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Uh, maybe the less glamorous place to be, but um, definitely a place where I'm most responsive. I'm at Melanie Wilmisher and would love to share my journey. I think like I present maybe an overly cautious perspective, but I hope that it's helpful for some people. And I just really value this time with you, Tony and Ashley. So thank you so much for your insight. Hey, Melanie, thank you so much. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Brandon, welcome to the show. And we're just going to jump right into it because you have an exciting update for us and let's hear it. Yeah, big morning. Um, under contract on a townhouse over in uh, Delano, Minnesota. Woo woo! Congratulations, man. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Came together pretty quick. Um, that was one that the investor had reached out to me on. And he's got, he actually broke ground this morning on a uh, mid-sized apartment complex that he was looking to roll this one into. Came to me at 275, and we eventually settled on 255 and uh, 6% uh, interest. So are you doing it as seller financing? Uh, it's a purchase money mortgage. So uh, I'm not too familiar with the term. It sounded like it was more of a bank he works with a lot, offers him lines of credit that he was able to um, kind of put my name on. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. I hadn't heard anything of that again. Yeah. Brandon, real quick, just in case anyone is jumping in new here and they haven't listened to the other episodes, can you just explain real quick what your goal was coming into um, this night, these 90 days? Uh, goal of the first 90 days was to finally get a pro- or uh, property. Been looking for a while and just kind of needed kind of a nod that I was doing things right so that the numbers I was looking at made sense. And what was your most important next step from last week? Uh, from last time, it was uh, starting making offers. Don't worry about hurting people's feelings because um, I was worried about coming in too low and then them just saying no and not even countering, uh, which did not happen once. <laughs> so how many offers did you make during since we last talked to you? How many offers did you put in? Uh, five of them. So still not as many as I would like. Um, but the first three of them actually had some interest. Um couple counters and other things just haven't lined up quite yet uh, waiting to hear on some that are waiting for more offers as they still have a couple showings trickling through as they're about 30 days on market so what, what would you say brandon was like the the big lesson that you learned after submitting all those offers in the last couple of weeks uh that they if they are emotional about it i don't know about it <laughs> uh, if their feelings are hurt their agent just comes back and kind of says yes or no, or a new number has been the most consistent response. Um, Usually not too far off the asking price initially anyways. What would be your advice to rookies who are kind of in the same situation as you and maybe were kind of stuck as to where you were last week? Yeah, biggest lesson I learned is making offers did work. They got me more responses and eventually got me a property. Say that louder and again so everybody can hear that lesson. <laughs> Making offers does work, even if you're worried about hurting their feelings and it's way off the asking price. There you go, man. And and, and that's so cool because we, we were just talking with Melanie about this as well, right? About like the, the velocity or the volume of, of offers. The, the more offers you put out, the easier it is going to become for you to find a deal that makes sense. If I only submit you know two or three offers a week, most likely most of those offers are going to be rejected. If I submit 200 offers a week, I'm probably going to get at least two or three deals that actually make sense. So yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic thing. Brandon, what was, what was the, the kind of shift in mindset? And you touched on it a little bit about not, not getting emotional, but what was that shift in mindset you had to make to be able to increase the number of, of offers that you made? Um, just biggest shift was just looking at it at numbers, not looking at pictures of the house in between the analysis on it or the area or what it would be like to own three of them when I don't own any of them at this point, just getting analytical about it. 
So walk us through what's next for you. So this morning you went and did the walk through the property. What, what's the plan going forward? Uh, as of right now, closing sitting on February 1st um, for ease as there is a tenant in that property already until May of 24. So that's next up on that property, walk through it. And there's a couple things that could be done, but biggest things looked fine. Windows, um, furnace and air is older, but it did sit eight vacant when it was built for about two years. So those things weren't running as much. So hopefully a few more years out of those. Is that from your own walkthrough or is that from the property inspection report? Some of these things you're calling out? That was my own walkthrough. Got it. Have you had an, an inspection done on the property yet? No, uh, that was something that we had debated on, but with the history of it and being a townhouse, so it's liability on the bigger stuff is a bit more protected just through the FHA stuff instead of having to worry about replacing the roof, um, sidings and windows and stuff like that. So the structural things weren't as big a concern. It was more looking under sinks for wet spots, how old's the furnace, the air, what kind of shape are the plumbing fixtures in. So Brandon, are you thinking about potentially moving forward without doing the inspection? Uh, yes, as of right now, that was the plan. Got it. Ash, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you do you typically buy with no inspections? Yeah, I haven't had an inspection in a long time, just because I'm usually buying such dumpy, dilapidated properties, anyways. That I don't know what more a, you know, what difference an inspection is going to make. That <laughs> this whole place is going to be gutted. But um, I I'm curious as to to why did the seller say that that was you know, something they wanted, they didn't want the inspection? Or did you feel kind of like pressured that your offer would be better if you didn't move forward with having an inspector there? Or just that you you have the knowledge? Uh, it was the train of thought with that if something does come off, if the furnace isn't any good, that's not a big deal for me. The water heater's older, that's not a big hurdle. That's materials in a few hours uh, since I'd be able to tackle that. Since you're naming off these things, I actually got a text when this podcast recorded that I have to put in a water softener for a property that's going to be $4,500. So maybe after this episode, I can pick your brain on something like that because I was just like, oh, here we go. Another expense on a property. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just had to mention that because I, that is such a great resource that you have that you know a lot about the mechanics of a property and you can go in yourself and gauge. And I think that's important to mention that, you know, maybe somebody thinks they have no experience or, you know, no kind of knowledge or way to contribute to a deal, especially if they're looking to partner to someone. But, you know, you being able to assess some of these situations, I think is a, a great advantage. Yeah, I think I actually would suggest still though, Brandon, that you do move forward with the property inspection and, and here are two two reasons why. First, I think that the property inspector, if you find a good one, this is someone who's highly trained in identifying deficiencies within side of properties. And even though you, you do have a background in the trades, um, they do this all day, every day. And their ability to maybe pick up on things that someone like me, Ashley, or, or yourself might miss um, is, 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 is there, right? So I think they can work as a really solid set of second eyes for you. And second, if something major does come up in that property inspection report, you now have leverage to go back to that seller and say, look, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, here's an unbiased third party that identify this potentially major issue that you and I need to come to an agreement on how we resolve. And it's good for the, that it's coming from the inspector and not just from you, because if you walk it and you point out, Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, here's this issue. The seller could say, well, I mean, you're, you're biased. Of course, you're going to point those things out because you're, you're buying this property from me. The property inspector, they're like an appraiser. They get paid regardless of whether or not you're actually closing that property. So they have no, um, you know, they have no skin in the game in terms of whether or not you actually move forward with it. Their only job is to report the facts. Um, so I do think, especially with you being new in the game, that there probably would be some value in you doing that. Um, and hopefully it comes back and it's all clear or things that you feel aren't, aren't a big deal, but it would be a really bad situation or a regrettable situation if you you know uncovered some major issue after the fact. Yeah. Brendan, did you get a, a quote at all as to how much it would cost to have an inspector come to look at the property at all? Um, not for that size um, unit specifically, but I've heard about 380 to about 450 pretty consistently. 
And, and you know, I mean, you're, you're buying the house for a few hundred thousand bucks, like, you know, invest another 400 up front to, to make sure that the, everything un, under the hood is working well, might, might be worthwhile. So I think that would be my, my only bit of advice for you. I do have another question in regards to kind of paperwork stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've been asked this morning on if I'd prefer a attorney's opinion on the title or if I want the full title insurance coverage. Title insurance is about $1,200 and the attorney's opinion is about 400 I would do the title insurance because you don't want to run into the situation where you go to sell the property and somebody who's purchasing it requires title insurance. Um, maybe they're doing some type of financing or, you know, they they have an investor that wants title insurance. If there is that gap in the insurance policy, there may the then a new title company may not come and cover that property, and you'll have to wait a period of time for you know claims to be made or whatever before they will actually put a policy onto the property again. So that would be my um, opinion on that. Is I would go ahead and get that title insurance on the property for sure. Totally agree. Yeah, title insurance would be what I was thinking, but I didn't know if it would be slightly different for townhouses since it's a group of 20, 30 people that would, if it was like land disputes or something like that, would also be fighting that. Yeah, no, just for the fact of an exit strategy for you, I would go with the the title insurance so that you have more options of to how people can purchase the property from you. Okay. So, Brandon, have you started to kind of gather a list of things, um, a checklist that you have to go through to um, create this, you know, to, things you'll have to do during the acquisition of the property, such as switch the utilities and things like that? I do have an acquisition checklist that I use if you want me to send it to you. And it's just like, you know, little reminders, like get insurance on the property, switch your electric, uh, make sure the property taxes are now in your name, things like that, if you'd find that useful. Yeah, I definitely would. Um, I actually did get started on property insurance this morning because there's an insurance agent who also owns an investment property in that uh, section of townhouses. So he actually reached out to me already. <laughs> oh, awesome. That makes it easy for you, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was a good reminder because it was something I hadn't really thought of until this point. Yeah, in, to be honest, and I think I've probably said this a couple times on the podcast, it was probably maybe my fourth or fifth property. My real estate agent called me the day before closing was like, you got insurance? You got the utility switch? And I was like, oh my gosh, no, I didn't get insurance. <laughs> I got to do that right now. <laughs> and that's definitely the benefit of having a great agent where they can do it for you that day. But um, So that's why I have the checklist is just so every single time it's the same things over and over again. And Tony, I, I'm sure with you, there's some a lot of things that are repeated and especially with the short-term rentals, having to furnish everything like that. Totally. Like, uh, just like a quick side note, like Amazon has the ability, if you have, uh, maybe it's with the personal account, but if you have an Amazon business account to create reorder lists. So literally all of our household essentials, we just have a reorder list. We have one for the kitchen. We have one for the bathrooms. We have one for the bedrooms. So whenever we launch a new property, instead of having to go through and like look for all these items, we click three buttons and we're able to reorder everything for the, for an entire house. And then we have a, a larger property launch checklist. Um, you guys can actually download that for free if you go to the real estate robinsons.com forward slash uh, checklist, I think it is. Um, but it's like a bunch of steps that we go through to get our property like up and running on a repeatable in a repeatable way. Brandon, is there anything you're doing right now to kind of document and keep track of some things that um, are happening during this process for you that maybe you want to keep track of going forward? Yeah, right now it's a, uh... Just kind of on paper, writing down addresses, offers, um, how many days since I've heard from them, keeping track of days on market, uh, stuff like that. Uh, as far as the acquisition checklist, I haven't done too much about that yet, other than insurance, which I got around about this morning. Um, utilities are in the renter's name already, um, and then just have to check everything over with the title company to make sure everything's good on my end for closing. One thing with the utilities too to find out about is sometimes uh, you can put the utilities, you can be listed as the landlord. So when that person moves out of the property, the utilities are automatically put back into your name. So one benefit of that is like, so around here, a lot of the properties have natural gas. Well, if a tenant moves out and they cancel the gas, it you have to, to have the gas turned back on. You have to um, set up a time between... 
uh, set a day and it will be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. And you have to be at the property and they will come. So it's like a whole wasted day for them to come and turn the gas back on. And someone has to be there because they'll check the stove and stuff like that to make sure that there's no leaks. But um, so you can maybe look into the utilities too and see if there's that program. And also it just saves you time so that when people do move out, you're not having to call and say, I need to put the utilities back into my name, give your information, things like that where it will just automatically revert to you as the landlord anytime somebody moves out. Yeah, that's a good bit of information. I'll have to ask about that. Okay, cool. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for coming on with us uh, this week and sharing your information. We're super excited for you and can't wait to see how it goes. Yeah, super pumped for you, man. Yeah, I'm really excited. Well, Brandon, thank you so much, and we will see you in a couple weeks. Looking forward to it. Lawrence, welcome back to the show. How have you been? Thank you so much uh, for having me um, back. Um, I would probably say the most exciting thing thus far, um, which I want to congratulate you, Ashley, on your book, because I have (laughs) a copy of the Real Estate Rookie 90 Day Book. And I am so excited to dig into this book, especially chapter nine, which talks about making offers, because this um, episode with me will talk about how I I definitely took action to make offers. So I'm excited to dig into that book. And I think everyone should get a copy of it. Lawrence, thank you so much. That just made my day. And also, I appreciate all your love across Instagram, too, today. (laughs) Of course. It takes a village to be a real estate investor. (laughs) And Lawrence, we will send you your check for that promotion after we cut this episode. Cody, you just did another joke. We were just talking about that in the last podcast recorded. So he's had two jokes for the year now. (laughs) Now I'm at at three. So, Lawrence, tell us, um, before we actually get into what you've done the last couple of weeks, just remind everyone what kind of your goal is right now, what you're trying to reach. Of course. Uh, So my major goal is to um, add a property this year using um, seller financing, owner financing. Um, Right now, I have two rental properties that were traditional, um, that were used with traditional uh, bank lending. And so right now, with interest rates being higher, if I'm able to put together an advantageous deal that works for the seller and myself, um, I would move forward. So my overall goal is to purchase a property <laughs> using uh, seller financing because I definitely want to utilize that that tool in, in my real estate investor toolbox. And then, um, so t- fill us in as to what has happened. Yeah, of course. Uh, so last week, um, my men's, my most important next step was to actually put the offer in through seller financing. Um, and I submitted an offer. I, um, jumped in and, um, did, did the offer for 7% because, uh, listening to my very first homework from you guys, Pace says that he likes to, you know, get properties for no more than 7% down. So I was like, Hey, I just submit the offer and see what happens. So the offer, my offer was 7% down payment, um, for the full asking price, um, 8% interest with, um, a 30 year term, three year hold whatsoever. Um, they countered, with um, a 9% rate and at minimum 10% down. And so when I ran my numbers and, um, in my uh, real, um, rental analysis, um, it was coming to that kind of break even. Um, and then also this particular property was um, redone as a potential flip. So some of the finishes are really um, more in line for for someone to like rebuy it. So I have to make sure that I'm not um, going to have a rental that would be outpriced in the rental market. Um, so when they counter with that, you know, I um, I was like, you know, hey, is, is, there, is there any way we can revisit it? And he was like, no, that's what we want. Um, and the interesting thing was when I first finished my um, talk with you all, it went pending. And so I was like, oh, that was my opportunity. It, it was just pending. And then within like maybe 72 hours, it came back on the market. And that's when I was like, that's my opportunity submit to submit my offer. And within like 15 minutes, the realtor replied and was like, hey, we'll counter with this amount. And then when I was like, oh, no, it looks like it, it really won't work for me. Is there any way we can revisit um, it? And he was like, no, I'm adamant that my uh, seller wants, you know, these terms. Because originally he wanted 20 percent down, uh, which is a big gap from 20 to 10. And I was offering seven. So definitely it's it's a flip like 
kind of gone bad and they're trying to recover some some funds from it. So I get it. Um, but within the last seven days, now the property is on contingent. So um, I don't know exactly what they're trying to chase with that property. Um, I definitely did my homework and, and did that. But moving forward, um, another thing that we talked about was reaching out to listings that um, have been on the market for 30 days. So I put together um, a spreadsheet that I can track data where I have one sheet that's um, rental properties that are over 30 days on the market. Those I'm going to start to put together my mailers. I've already started to to draft them and they'll be send, send, I'll be sending those out. And then another sheet on the um, Excel sheet will be um, the properties that are for sale that's um, over 30 days. Right now, that's not a long list in my market because it's, it's such a rural area. Um, that list is less than about se- seven properties that kind of fit my my buy box really honestly maybe four to five so my men's for next time will be to put in those offers um for those properties that have been on the market for over 30 days for sale yeah i I think for my side lawrence first i just want to congratulate you even though you didn't get an accepted offer you submitted that offer and you got a counter offer back, right? So there was some dialogue that was going on between you and that seller. So if anything, even though it wasn't a closed deal, it is proof of concept that there is interest from sellers in your market to potentially explore a seller finance deal. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm noticing a similar theme between you, Melanie, and, and Brandon, and, and that all of you need to potentially just increase the number of offers you're putting out, so that the uh, you know the, the conversations you start having start to increase as well. But I think don't don't let it pass you by, Lawrence, that you did have a, a bit of success by at least having that that conversation around the seller financing. And a question that I have for you all um, would be that was a big numbers difference of them wanting originally 20% down versus me offering 7% and then they're counting countering with 10%. Have you all ever kind of encountered that as well? Um, because it's a, it's a big numbers difference, you know, where they're, that where, where essentially they'll be leaving half on the table, you know, 20% down versus 10% down up front. Yeah. I've seen people want 50% down. <laughs> and it's like, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing seller financing for me. But that's where it comes into play as to what are they going to be doing with the money? Why are they selling? Is it because they need, you know, a down payment on, you know, a primary residence or something, or they need to fund their kid's college? Um, so looking at that, is this a situation where you could get face to face with the seller and talk to them directly? Possibly not because um, it, a broker does have it. Um, so, I mean, if there's a will, there's a way I may be able to see if I can, you know, get in contact with that person because, like I said, it, it truly seems as though it was a flip um, gone bad in, in this particular um, climate of a market that we're at because it's a, a beautiful property. You know, everything is brand new. And like I said, it's really one of the properties where it will um definitely stand out in, a, in as a rental um with more of finishings inside to sell so if i can possibly be able to talk directly with that seller i feel like i could be able to just you know um do the deal and again i don't want to undercut or burn bridges in such a small uh town that i'm in with any type of brokers or realtors but i definitely feel as though um we could possibly work something out. Yeah. And you definitely don't want to do that and kind of overstep that boundary. But I think it's worth asking if maybe you could have that conversation with the seller and ask that to the broker, because I think it's a lot easier to figure out what their motivation is as to why they want to sell and kind of come to that agreement or have that negotiation in person. Um, and just kind of, you know, say, is there time that we could sit down together and talk about this? I'd like to to see this work. And then you can kind of figure out, do they have a number? I've sat down with a seller before who's just said, I need $3,500 a month. Okay, well, let's slap 
25 year amortization on that three and a half percent interest. And that gets me at the 3,500. Boom. We're both happy. So I think if there is a way that you can find that out, or even just asking the broker as to, you know, what is the reason they want such a large down payment? Maybe it's because they're scared of doing seller financing and someone not paying. So, you know, what are some ways that you could kind of um, make them more knowledgeable about how this is a benefit to them also, and that you are not a risk. Can you, you know, give your tax return to them? Can you supply a credit report? Can you give them a sense of security if that is their issue? So there's some way that you can find out why they want that larger down payment, if they need that money for something, or if it's, you know, the the risk part. I think that may be able to help you tailor your offer to come to an agreement. No, that that definitely makes sense because like I said, you, you never know, like you really can't be in the mind of the seller until you actually have conversations and um, understand. And one thing that I would be doing with any of my offers for uh, seller financing based upon my homework that I learned from Pace was that I would include a performance deed into it. And so with that performance deed, it pretty much lets them know, hey, buddy, if I don't pay, it's yours. You know, we don't have to go through this crazy foreclosure process. Well, it seems like you're making fantastic progress, Lawrence. Like I said, I I know it's not a deal under contract, but it definitely is a step in the right direction. Um, So as we look to next, uh, the next time that we chat, what do you feel are some of the things that you want to focus on to kind of help increase that deal flow? Uh, Definitely um, the biggest um, next step would be to increase those number, the number of offers. Um, So that would be a a big takeaway to increase um, the number of offers. And then, like I said, um, I'm going to definitely dig into chapter nine of Ashley's book about the offers um, because it's always good to kind of like see stuff on paper. I like to read stuff as well and um, see those gems that she's included in that book. So I would say the biggest one would be um, increasing the number of offers. Um, And then if I can be able to get directly in touch with sellers, um, that will, I'll have a more push for that um, if possible. Jeez, I hope we put a cap on the affiliate spending I'm doing here. On this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Um, and then, I'm, again, my goal, if possible, you know, it would be to, if I can, have a, a chat with Pace Morby. Um, so that will that will be awesome um, to be able to kind of like run through some things because I know from the videos that I watch with him, he... Um, He's like, you know, like you can definitely um, get a seller to say yes. <laughs> so, Lawrence, what's going to be kind of the next step? I think one thing is ta- like go back and try to work with the seller more and not give up on this. But are you going to be continuing looking at other deals? Where's kind of your head at with that? Uh, so definitely, um, like I said, I, I will be sending out those mailers as well. The only thing about mailers is that you never know when they are going to come back. Um, and then the I don't want to have to pivot, but I would say if I did have to pivot, um, the only other option would be if I would to if I were to b- purchase another property, like um, own or occupy, because I have three properties: one primary residence and two rental properties. Um, the only thing about that is my primary has so much equity in it, and you know I'm, I'm able to have like a, a, a equity piggy bank, like a HELOC on it. Um, so that would be kind of like my final resort if I have to to pivot to be able to go and do owner occupy and put put 5% down. Yeah, I think my my only last piece of advice Lawrence is maybe also look at folks in, in maybe different uh different situations because right now you're looking at people you you know the the listings that have kind of grown stale things like that but I I wonder if there's like you know what w- what you need is someone who is uh, in a distressed situation, um, potentially, right? Um, so I don't know if that's like a, I don't know, I don't know, like divorce or something that's in probate or, you know, some of these other situations where there's like, hey, I just inherited this house and I live in, the house is in, you know, where you live, but I'm, I live in, you know, Buffalo, New York, and I don't want to manage this property from 3,000 miles away. So, um, maybe as you as you start to think about who you reach out to, maybe start to open up that um, open up that criteria a little bit, and, and see if you can find some more folks to chat with. Yeah, and I definitely know that um, 
there's an opportunity kind of for that um, because unfortunately we are in a military town and you know people get divorced and stuff of that nature um, or they or they are not a native of this area and they don't want to you know they bought a house but now they don't want to turn into a rental um, so there are some possibilities there that I can definitely probably look in to see if there um, would be somebody that's um, in a distressed uh, situation so it's just like last idea and this is like super crazy but since you are in a military town um and, and we actually did this for one of our properties in, in Joshua Tree. Um, we re, there's a, a military base in, in 29 Palms, which is right near Joshua Tree. And we were looking for someone to midterm rent one of our properties while we waited for the permit to come in. And we reached out to the base and we said, hey, we have a property. Um, are there any folks at the base that might want to come rent this out? So they, they literally sent someone out to our properties. They scoped it out. They said, hey, here's how much we can give you for rent. Um, and you know, obviously, we're going to be getting our permit before they, they place someone. But I wonder if you could go to the base and say, hey, is there anyone that's in charge of, you know, people that are, are leaving this city, right? And they're, they're maybe getting transferred somewhere else and they need help to sell their property or they need help to do something else, right? Um, it might be a little more difficult because they probably bought with VA loans. You're looking at like lower interest rates, but like you said, assumable mortgages, maybe that's something that you could assume on, on their behalf. And I don't know, just something, that, you know, maybe you reach out to them and, and there's some, something, that you, something there that you can kind of pull on to, to get some more insights. Yeah, no, that's definitely um, an opportunity, you know, um, especially um, if you're able, if I'm able to, you know, do that. Um, usually I can try to see if I can get to as many captains as possible because they normally have soldiers who are in those distressed situations um, that are like, um, and, and, and uh, PCS season is coming up, um, which is normally when, you know, they have a permanent change of their duty station. Um, so other than that, you know, I'm definitely going to keep rocking and rolling and I would probably the biggest takeaway that I would give thus far to rookies is that you have to put the offers in. You you just have to. Well, Lawrence, thanks so much for coming on with us this week. Um, is there any besides that little last piece of advice? Can you share something else with us? Because I, I feel like you're very much someone that, you know, can instantly learn something in a situation and you hold on to that. And you're also very good at, at, at sharing what you're doing. Um, I would say um, definitely um, you always want to make sure that you are, you know, adding value to people. Um, I think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, I have had so many unbelievable and endless opportunities in the real estate because of adding value to people. Um, and so for me, um, that's, something that has allowed me to buy properties, you know, beating out cash buyers or whatsoever. So I would say your integrity is very important and to add value because we're all in, all in this together. We're, we have one common goal and that's to, you know, build a real estate portfolio and none of us can't buy every single property in the world. So. Tony, this is what I love about our group of mentees is that they're not only like asking questions and they're, you know, grinding and doing amazing things, but they're also adding value to our listeners. So that's why I love you guys. And you guys contribute so much to our listeners too, with sharing your journey and also giving the advice and the life lessons that you're learning along the way. Well, Lawrence, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm Ashley at Wealth from Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we will be back on Saturday with a rookie reply.